Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Today is March 11th. And we're still on the background for this tiger painting. And I just put out a brand new paint for most of my palette. I used up a lot of paint yesterday. So yesterday, um, <clears throat> and sorry, I'm going to be making a little bit of noise here. I, I have to put out some paper towels. Good morning, thinker. Usually I have this ready before, you know, at the end of every paint session, I usually have all this ready. Um, but I, I like my setup to be a certain way so that I don't have to waste any time uh, getting things set up or waste any time while I'm painting, looking for something or getting my um, paper towels folded in the way that works best for the painting session. So anything that you can set up that will make one decision rather than hundreds over the course of time is best. So for example, I fold my paper towels like this. They're like in a, you know, square or whatever. And I know how to pick them up. I know how to grab them and put paint in them or use them. And I don't have to sit here and refold my paper towels every time I need one. So I made the decision or the, the choice once by folding my paper towels before every session. And now it's easier. Or like cleaning my palette beforehand. Because it's so important when you're motivated to paint to actually remove all, you know, everything that's in your way. So you can just get right to it. For example, I mean, my, uh, my palette, what's covered here, but I am, you know, everything's sitting out so that I don't have to reset up the stream or my painting every day. I have to move things around a little bit, but yeah, uh, not so much. Okay. So this is going to be fun because yesterday I used, uh, Galkid light to paint with Galkid light here. And we did cover a lot of canvas. A lot of it was, um, and boy, that, that's really dark on the right side for you. A lot of it was just kind of a, a very, you know, big block in for initial layers, especially right down, you know, at the center right here with the tree that's up. And the one thing I noticed is I do not have my iPad up here. I've, I had to charge it yesterday and I forgot to put it back. I have to grab that. It's important that I see what I'm painting. Just a little bit. There we go. Now, okay, I got my iPad set up, uh, but what I'm interested in is, it'll, is that alkyd medium dry right now? And if it is, that's great. If it's even tacky, that's great too. So let's see, I'm just going to put my finger right in it. Yeah, that's, I could still pull off a tiny bit of paint, but it's pretty darn dry. Of course it's painted on pretty thin but that's that's drawing really fast what about up here where it's a bit thicker oh wow that's really dry up there um i would say it has some to do with uh, the paint that i put in there as well such as burnt umber which i forgot to put on my palette i really need to create a checklist for this it seems i'm forgetting stuff every time and the one thing I don't like right now, um, 
Or organization is a big thing for me when I'm painting, okay? I, I know there's, you know, this stereotype for artists to be disorganized and messy. Um, <clears throat> I am not that type of artist. I don't like being that type of artist. Uh, and I think if you fall into that stereotype, you can be a better artist if you try and get away from it as much as you can. Uh, and hopefully I can help you get some tools to, to do that. And what I don't like is, you know, I just, I just threw that burnt umber down on the, on the palette. Uh, and it doesn't go there. It's not the place that I put it. And you may think, well, why does that matter? I mean, it's, it's just a doll of the paint. You just grab it real quick. Well, anytime you have to make, because you'll be grabbing paint constantly and instantly throughout your painting session. And what you want to do is you don't want to have to think about, okay, where is my color? Oh, that's right. It was over here. Now it's over there. And then, you, and then three days ago, I put it up here. Um, always have this, you know, repeat the same things over and over again. So it keeps you from making those constant decisions. Now, of course, all these new colors that I've added, I'm going to put down at the bottom here because these are these are not things that I use very often at all. So it's going to be where I need to make decisions anyways. And I'm just moving these around with a palette knife because it's so much easier. And I'm also using my um, uh, razor blade to clean off any excess so that at least the, the bigger paint daubs or uh, right out of the tube doesn't mix with what's left on there. And see, this is my sap green, which has a place. You know, I put my sap green right there. Honestly, it should be closer to blue if I was sticking with, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. And yeah, you know, so right there. And the burnt umber, I keep, a, I keep the burnt umber on this side because it's an earth tone. And I mean, a transparent earth red, earth red and earth orange, earth orange is up there is also kind of an earth tone, but I use it mainly for skin tones. So I keep it around my yellows and reds, but you no, know, everything up at the top here from this up, um, I have on my palette in those spots, the yellows, I line up the same every single time. So if I, this is like a, a cadmium lemon, um, which usually I never put cadmiums out. I'm just trying to get rid of this, these cadmiums. I would do like a Hansa yellow light. So a white yellow. So it's closer to white, you know, and then a more uh, yellow, yellow. <laughs> That's closer to red. And my orange would be right here, right in between. If I needed an orange, then my red uh, transparent earth um, orange is here. And then I would put transparent earth red in between. A lizard permit always goes there. And then sometimes I have like some different blue colors. Um, I forget which blue I would put there. And then ultramarine and then some, you know, whatever green I have, sap green for neutralizer and then my earth tones. Then white always goes down at the bottom center. And now I have these new colors on here um, that worked well for the background. And I know you guys are like, blah, 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 whatever, Chris, organization, who cares? Um, or maybe you're not, maybe you're intently listening and I shouldn't assume that, but it's, it's, it is really important to have an organized manner about the way you paint. If you want to be a professional artist, act like a professional artist, um, and be professional with everything you do. Regardless if you sold a painting or you've completed more than three paintings, act like a professional artist um, in everything that you do and the rest will, will follow, really. Okay, enough of that. So I'm happy with the Alcott Medium so far. That's working well. I do think that uh, part of the reasons why it's drying really quickly is because it is those colors, those darker colors that tend to dry faster. 
but a real way to test is I have my cap of uh, the medium, which has been sitting out overnight. And it, it looks like it's gotten thicker. Let's see. Yeah, maybe. No, it's still just as thin. Okay, so I would say that this is not something that would normally buy overnight. Um, at least the medium itself. Uh, and I think um, e exactly what I was, was talking about in my previous videos when I'm talking about uh, fat over lean without solvents. And, you know, the caveat here is this does have a petroleum distillate in it. Um, there's a very first caution on there. And it says, if swallowed. A big pause there. <laughs> Please don't swallow your mediums. So it has uh, zero scent to it. It has no scent. Um, it doesn't oxidize and create bad fumes. It's an alkyd. It's not an oil. I just want to make that perfectly clear. It's not an oil. It's an alkyd. They're different. They act different. Uh, what else does it have in it? Yeah, it only gives a warning of a petroleum distillate. It doesn't give any kind of indication of what else is in there. Now it does say on the front, combustible liquid and vapor. So it does have some kind of vapor to it, which, you know, I don't like, but we'll see. Um, so here's what I would say. If you begin your painting with, let's say a lot of people begin drawing and they need these very fluid strokes and they want to stay away from solvents. I would say the, uh, a fluid alkyd medium with a burnt umber to draw with would work really well because the burnt umber will dry really quickly. Um, the alkyd will dry quickly and you can get into painting. Uh, after your drawing, like the next day. And uh, protect your paint layers for fat over lean. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do today, let's get into painting, Chris. Stop talking. <laughs> I'm going to make up my darkest dark, and it's going to be a lot of it because I want to darken up the I want to darken up where the tree is on the bottom center or the center right area. So I'm using a bigger brush. This is a Winsor and Newton Monarch Filbert six that I'm using. Okay. And I'm actually going to switch back to the image that I have with the lines all over it with my grid so I can see where that tree was, which is actually hard to see. I think I'm going to actually change the drawing up a little bit on that. But as I look at the image, I mean, it's, it's so dark over there. And by the way, the image that you, that I added to the stream that you're seeing right now, um, is the same image that I'm working from that I, I lightened it up a bit, uh, digitally so that I could see uh, some of the colors, because on, on the, the screens, it just looks so dark, just tremendously dark. Hmm. 
And just a, a general shape of these trees, kind of like where they end. I'm gonna have to redraw the entirety of the edges of my palm fronds. Now, the one thing I will say is I'm going over an, an alkyd paint <clears throat> that I put down with some other paint that does have some of that alkyd medium in it, and it is very sticky. I do not like the texture very well at all. It is mixing still with that layer beneath, which is good. Because if it's sticky, it's not completely dry, but I want it wet enough where I could mix this next layer in with that bottom layer to help protect those layers so that they're all combined into one. It's not the separate layer where we have different drying times. So I did get a mixture within that, so that's fine. I like this painting a lot. Now I do want it to last for millennia, really. Because, you know, when we're talking about fat over lean, we're not talking about decades here. Um, the only thing that would really kill your painting uh, as far as its longevity with, you know, anything less than 10 years is if you took acrylic and you put it over oil, that would start falling off right away. But when we're talking about fat over lean, the, the problems that you run into take, you know, more than a decade to surface from, you know, from what I've seen. I'm going to lighten this, this tree up just a little bit. lighter. It's one of those things where there's, you know, there's just going to be a lot of guessing about it. Alkids are fairly new, and I could see a lot of people arguing about, you know, no one knows if in a hundred years from now, if any of these paintings that have alkid mediums in them uh, will crack and fall off the canvas. And in fact, I think even the, in, I haven't heard any reports of even the worst things painted falling off the canvas. Of course, I haven't done any research on it. It'd be kind of interesting if, you know, there's some uh, restoration professionals out there that have horror stories of really bad paint layers in the canvas and the paint actually falling off the canvas. The worst that I've seen is just cracking. Actually, the worst that I know about is the um, Last Supper by Da Vinci. I mean, I guess that's, that would be a really good example of the longevity even when you do the worst thing possible. Here you have a painting or a fresco 
that is actually just a, you know, partly fresco and partly um, a painting on a wall that was done with acrylic type medium and oil type medium layered incorrectly, which is like the worst thing you can do. And some of it's still there. <laughs> I would say it's mostly gone now. I think all the pictures you see of it are from years and years ago, but it, it just, but that was, that was created in what? No, I, I don't, uh, you know, Florence in the, during the, um, Oh man, I want to say revolution, not the revolution, the... Oh, what am I thinking here, thinker? It's, it's, it's when, it's right after the Dark Ages, uh, during the Enlightenment? Is that it? Enlightenment period, what they call it? I mean, this is ancient times we're talking about. And, the, you know, still some of it's there. So even the worst paint layers that you can come up with and some paintings are still existing. Okay, so I, I guess my argument, what I'm trying to say is so many beginning artists, they focus on, and I did this, I, you know, I am not exempt from this. And this is why I'm saying it because I've done it. They, they focus on um, archival and trying to get their paintings to last forever in an archival sense before they've even learned how to paint well when you know i was talking to my dad yesterday um about this because he found some old artwork of mine uh because he's cleaning up the house and he's like hey i found a bunch of old, old drawings of yours you know when i was a kid like in high school and of course he's keeping them because they're dear to him. And that's great. That's wonderful. But um, I said, yeah, he's like, well, they're still yours. So whenever you want them. And I said, no, dad, they're yours. I was like, I, I don't want them. Um, you have a sentimental attach attachment to them that I don't, basically. Uh, if I had them, I they would be in the garbage. I would just throw them away because they're... You know, they're not serving me in any, any way now. Uh, because I know as an artist, I've thrown away hundreds and hundreds, maybe even close to a thousand pieces of artwork. Uh, to get good at drawing, you need to make a few thousand bad drawings. Or a few hundred, let's say. Hundreds of bad drawings. To get good at painting, you need to make a whole bunch of bad paintings. This is how you grow and you get better. You make a whole bunch of bad paintings and you learn from them. And the reason why I'm talking about this and not my painting is because, well, I'm thinking about it. And also, um, I'm just filling in dark colors here behind these palm fronds. And I'm trying to, to keep kind of an understanding of where these palm fronds are in some way, but um, not very much to tell you the truth. I mean, it, there's just a bunch of lines here. I'm gonna have to go back over this once, it, once it's dry and just uh, redo the palm frond from the ground up. And that's, you know, that's par, par for the course on that. <clears throat> but when you worry too much about the archival quality of your artwork, you're hindering your learning process because you're being a bit too, you're, a, you're way too attached with your current work. If you're a beginning artist, right? I think what you can do most, uh, what you can do to help you the most is to get less attached with the work that you make at the beginning and understand that it's this is your period as a student where you're learning how to make good art 
you know, or better art, you know. That doesn't mean, I mean, if you if you really like what you're doing, go ahead, put it out for sale, you know, put it up in a gallery show. It's totally up to you. I was talking with a, another friend online about another mistake that I had made, uh, kind of like wasting time instead of painting. So, you know, I'm kind of a tinkerer, especially when it comes to, you know, building stuff. I used to have like uh, a garage full of woodworking tools because I enjoyed it. You know, I would, I would build stuff. And I thought, you know what? I could save a bunch of money if I just build my, you know, make my own stretcher bars, stretch my own canvas, um, you know, do everything myself, make my own panels. And what I, f and then, you know, I got to a point where I was like, oh, these are good. I wonder if someone else, you know, maybe I could sell these and make a small profit on them. And I started trying to do that. And this was before I even knew how to paint well. I mean, I was painting okay, but not very well. And I was talking to my friend and he was, you know, wanting to, to do all this. And I advised, I said, I said, don't do any of that. <laughs> Go out, spend the money, uh, and buy your paint supplies. Don't try and make them on your own, especially when you're beginning. Even when you're not beginning, I would say just, just buy them. Number one, they will be made better than you can make them in a lot of aspects. Unless you're a very avid woodworker, then maybe, you know, that's your calling and not art. I don't know, but, um, or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe you can do both. Maybe you have enough time in the day to, to do all that. That's up to you. But I would say just put in the hours painting more than anything. That's more important. Get better, get good. <laughs> So now I, you know, I don't make stuff, I buy it so that, and what I'm buying is not just, you know, the, the canvas and everything. What I'm buying is my time and the most valuable thing on the planet, more valuable than the most expensive jewels or cars or materials is time. Time will always be the most valuable thing. And if you can buy time, do it every single day. You know, every time you have that choice to buy time, do it. It's always a winning choice because it is the most valuable. It is a finite resource uh, that will march on no matter what. So yeah, I, I would suggest never to make your own, own art supplies. Just buy them from people that do them professionally, you know, support them, those people. Thinker, am I ranting too much? I feel like I'm ranting too much. I'm trying to give, you know, as much advice as possible while I'm just filling in colors here. And boy, I can't see anything up here. It's just super glare. I'm going to have to kind of guess at what I'm putting down and then step back and make an adjustment. I'll just add some teal into it and then it'll be good. Yeah, I'm not really focusing too much right now on the colors and things that I'm putting back here. What I am focusing on more is that <clears throat> the value is where I want it. 
in a very simple way, like this is darker than that. And I've already used up all of my uh, ultramarine blue. So I'm, I'm worrying mostly just about value back here. Uh, it's, you know, a very simple block in layer. And it will need uh, extra work to it. Kind of dangerous, honestly. I should be focusing a bit more on, you know, the, the subtle changes in some of this. It would help the future me out. So I think what I'll do after I get uh, the rock kind of blocked in with some gray, I'll go back through what I just put on and some of these other sp spaces uh, from yesterday. And I'll focus on, you know, adding in some of the variation that, that it needs. But before that, I need more ultramarine blue. And burnt umber. I tell you what, you add some of that medium to your paint and you just go through the paint a lot faster. I had talked about this before, but the reason why I don't like putting these big blocks of just color in is because they're, um, they are too undirected for me. There's, I, I know what would, what could happen from them. Uh, like I would, you know, there's no way in heck, uh, there's no way I would do this with the tiger, uh, especially the head or any of the stripes or anything uh, where that's at, because uh, I would just have to fix. There would be nothing but fixes going on for the rest of the painting. You know, where is this drawing at? Where is that drawing at? Out here, it's it's not so bad. It's, it's not the, the center of interest. Uh, it's not super important if it if it looks kind of wonky in some ways, as long as it's not distracting from the tiger, um, I think it's going to be fine. But there's a tendency that when you block in these huge areas that um, what you'll, what I'll have to do with this is really redo everything that I just already put down. I like, you know, when I paint, for some of the strokes to be finishing strokes, like, okay, if I can get close, and this is the why I, I use these kind of small splotches when I paint, is if you can, you know, uh, what you put down, you can call it a quote unquote block in, but it's a very accurate block in where you're just establishing a paint layer, you're establishing um, values some saturation, some hues, this kind of thing, and you're pretty close, uh, it's, it saves so much time later on. Just a tremendous amount of time is saved later on. So this would be the lighter side of the rock, this value that I have here. I'm going to slow down a bit here, go back to the daubs, but I'm using a bigger brush, so there are bigger daubs, right? And I'm going to make sure that what I put down right now is pretty close to the uh, reference that we created, the original painting. I will keep everything very soft, though. I'm going to try and reduce all hard edges in this, everything in this background right now.
I'm keeping this rock uh, more on the cooler side of things. And the way I painted it is more kind of like granite. Granite it is, is a very speckled rock. So what's your plan? For, I, I've talked enough, so, and I hate to make you keep typing there, thinker. I know it's, <laughs> I know it's uh, not the the easiest thing for you, but what's your plans for the day? Your art plans for the day? How's the um, color wheel coming along? Have you found it helpful yet? I got mine right, right down here where I can look at it. I can reference it as I'm painting. I think eventually, the more that I reference that color wheel, in the future, I could see myself like not even needing it. Like I could rattle off the Munsell notation for each color that I have. Oh, cadmium red light or medium. That that's uh, seven point five R, right? Yep, I was right on that one. What is Hansa yellow medium? Is well, I mean, I guess to get more exact on that one, the, the cadmium red would be seven point five R with a six a sixteen of um, chroma. The highest chroma you can get in paint is 16. The only other one that's on 16 for me is I had a cadmium orange. I think I still have some. Yeah, I still have cadmium orange. I love the idea of being able to use, you know, the Munsell system. And if I wanted to you know, paint a painting with super intense colors. I could, you know, quickly go on to the Gamblin website and look at all of the paints that they have and find everyone listed as, you know, a 14 or a 16. And those would be all the paints that I get. Okay, just finished making a table of all the Munsell notations for the colors I have. Next is actually painting the dots of paint in the right places. Oh, did you do a digital table? Like, uh, like a database? Next is actually painting the dots of paint in the right places. I remember you said that you, you have worked in IT. Gave me, you know, a better understanding and, uh, more respect for you in the digital realm which i don't know maybe uh maybe you're typing on an ipad or something i guess that's why it would be difficult for you to type because that's not easy to type on an ipad got to get out the uh the keyboard but that's a good idea making a table
actually what's interest what's going to be uh i'm i'm having it being i'm kind of ex really excited today because um uh my best friend uh josh johnson who also has a youtube channel um we're going to be recording he's deep into notion and we're going to be recording uh setting up a, an art artist companion database in notion it's like this whole dashboard and everything and i've been wanting to i've been you know kind of playing with notion for a while and then i'll, I'll try different things nothing's really worked but he's got this awesome setup that he showed me and i was like okay we need to create a video for others and you will i'll be there with you and because he's creating videos on his own too um and you teach me how to set this up and we can release it and teach a whole bunch of other people how to uh, artists how to set up you know an awesome database for um an art business you know for them in notion and i'm excited about it because we're going to be recording it today starting the recording i'm guessing it would take you know a few recordings to get everything um figured out on it but that's something i could add to my notion database would be you know all the table of my colors that i have the ones i use okay Oh, an analog list. Okay. I may convert to a digital later. Have you ever tried Obsidian? Yes, I have tried Obsidian uh, once. So Obsidian, um, it's like kind of like one step away from Rome, if I remember. And uh, what, what do you call it? Um, Hidley Wiki, which <laughs> is a funny name. Uh, I tried that. Uh, went to Rome, then tried Obsidian, then then went to Ample Note. It was another one for a relational database or you know uh, interlinked kind of notes and things. Nothing really worked for me. I'm all on Google right now, but that's starting not to work for me because there's a lot of things. Like I, I want things to calculate. I want things to, to be put into like a dashboard where um, I could look at the projects that I have going on, see what's next, make a bunch of notes. And the, the other thing I like about Notion, and I don't know if you're into ChatGPT, um, but I've been using ChatGPT a lot lately to help me out with a lot of things. And um, using it responsibly. That's what you have to have to kind of be careful with when we're talking about AI. But uh, Notion has its own built-in AI now. And uh, Josh is saying it's fantastic because, you know, he's made it part of his workflow. So, I'm interested in that. All right, so I'm going to go, uh, while we're talking about digital stuff, I'm going to go... Um, Actually, I'm going to step back because there's so much glare at the top of this. And actually, I think I might drop the painting down a bit too, so that you guys can see better. Ooh, hopefully I don't knock over everything. Oh, here's... Here's another tip uh, as far as oil paintings concerned and glare. Like I'm wearing a light gray shirt. Um, usually a bad idea, especially when you're working on a dark painting. Uh, put on a black shirt, a black long sleeve shirt. Uh, that way that your clothing isn't causing some of the glare, which my clothing is. But as I stand back here, uh, the the values that I put down on the 
The tree on the left are way too light. I need to darken that up. So that's going to be the first thing that I do. And I need to add some variation in those trees because they're the lines there, the edges of the trees, the lines are standing out way too much. So yeah, I got some work to do, definitely. I don't think you guys are seeing much glare, no. Yeah, at least from what I can see on the small frame. See, like, even, I don't know if you guys can tell, but here's, you know, my white uh, paper towels. I wonder if you can see that. Yeah, you can see that. When it's dark, and I, you know, get this, this close to the painting, look at all the glare that this is causing. I mean, I'm, ba I'm changing all the values just instantly. Um, something you want to be aware of. I'm going to put my paper towels in a different place. And I changed to a black shirt. Because even my very pale, never go outside, stay inside white skin um, <laughs> is, is causing a lot of glare. I'm getting tired of mixing up my darkest dark, so with my brush. So I'm going to do it with a palette knife. And make up a really big pile here. There we go. Done. One action has saved me five or ten. So the first thing I'm going to do is take, uh, I'll probably start over here. I'm going to pull a big portion of that darkest dark. And I'm going to change the value of this tree on the left. Really darken this up. You know, even though I'm moving pretty quick on this and I'm afraid that it's going to cause me more work in the, you know, down the road, I am happy that I got most of the canvas covered because uh, it is giving me a better understanding of all the colors, values, and, and I, should, I should always say hue, all the hues, values, and saturation for what's on the tiger right now. And wow, even what I just put down here, I had just put this down maybe five, 10 minutes ago, and it is super sticky. Like it's hard to move my brush through that. Like I find myself just grabbing more and more of that alkyd medium. I am not sure if I'll use that in the future. I would most definitely not use this as a glazing layer. Not at all. Too sticky. Yeah, I don't like it. Okay, so I'm I'm kind of rethinking the, the whole alkyd medium idea. The next thing I want to do is darken up the side, uh, the inside portion of this tree because we have two trees here and I brought this one out a lot farther than was in our original and I may push it back. But the one thing I do want is this edge of it against the, the tree on the right to be much darker, to send it back further.
Yeah, I, I dislike the, the stickiness of these alkyd mediums. Or at least this alkyd medium. Maybe the other ones are, maybe other ones are different. I don't know, but... It's good that I'm not having a stream tomorrow. Hopefully this will dry by Monday. Completely by Monday. So uh, Thinker says, so now that you've, you're well into the oil painting, how much are you really referring to the digital painting? Um, I wish you could see my head. My head is like, well, I'm, my eyes really, because I don't move my head very much, but I'm constantly looking back and forth. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm referring to it constantly, still. Even when I threw down a bunch of this color, I'm still constantly referring to it. Yeah. So like right now, I'm looking at, uh, let me see, you can see like under the nose, like right here. So right above where you can see is, I worked on the background a bit more. It's got some variation in it. It looks like some uh, very, uh, unfocused limbs and different colorations back there. And then you can see that, you know, there's texture up there. There's information down here. It's just brush strokes. And so what I want to do is turn, and I kind of like that description. I want to turn this down here into information and not just brush strokes. Um, descriptions of a jungle and not just a bunch of brush strokes on a canvas. I mean, it will always be brush strokes, but there's a difference between, you know, looking at an area and just seeing brush strokes or just seeing a tree, if that makes sense. Will you do a digital painting at, at all for the small portraits uh, you're thinking about? Probably, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, I like the, you know, honestly, I like the connection between digital and traditional. And I like the idea, and let me get the painting while I'm talking. Um, I like the idea that I'm working from something I created rather than a phot photograph. Even if, you know, there, you know, I have a painting sitting over here to the side of two figures that I, man, I want to get back to finishing that, but I've started too many things in a, in the interim, but, um, even with that painting, I did a lot of adjustments to the, to the image itself. So it was photo manipulation. So the, the image that I'm working from is still something that I created, but taking it to another level and actually working from, you know, a digital painting that I created and painting a painting from a painting. I love the alliteration of that painting a painting from a painting. That'll be the, the next title for the live stream. <laughs> painting a painting from a painting. How many keywords can I get into that title, right? Um, I like that idea where, you know, it's one step closer to working from your head, from your memory, from your imagination. I think the most important part of what I want to do next with this live stream and you know in the weeks weeks from now or maybe hopefully less than that um, when I'm done with this painting and happy with it 
uh, is just to do smaller works. And I'm feeling a need to work on my portrait skills as well. Portraits, <clears throat> portraits are very consumable. And you know, this is another thing that I have to think that I'm thinking about. As an artist that wants to build a business on YouTube, or build an audience on YouTube, and then help others through tutorials and things that I sell and connect with other artists and eventually make a business out of it. Um, I need to think about what, where, where I can get that, where I can find the Venn diagram or, of what I love to do, what I'm good at, and what uh, people want to see. Or people find valuable enough to get give uh, some of their time and money. Especially their time, because time is more valuable. So yeah, if it's small, because uh, I've done digital portraits before and I enjoy doing those. And I, I could do those in uh, two to three streams, you know, two, you know, one or two hours. So yeah, I kind of like the idea. I'm kicking it around still. Of course, Stinker, because you're so awesome and you show up um, all the time. Uh, you will be the first to know. And I need more teal. <laughs> oh my god, that's way too much. Jeez, that that's cerulean blue, man. It is... It's a hue. Maybe that's why. It's a hue. It has just a ridiculous tinting strength. It will... It has killed my entire pile of color. <laughs> okay, so I'm done painting the house for now. I'm done throwing the paint around without thinking about objects that I'm actually painting. The major block end of the entire painting is done. And I don't need to do that again. Just working on describing something in the background right now. Through just a, a variation in value and somewhat in hue and saturation. And it's a bit warmer up here. I'm going to bring some of that warm color down. And I can do that. I'm trying to use up this cadmium yellow uh, or cadmium lemon. Cadmium lemon and a and my red will warm this up a lot. Maybe too much. I need to add some white to it. Gray it out. Are you thinking then that digital will become a regular part of your painting practice? I want it to. I think, um, I enjoy it a lot. It is so accessible. I think that's what I love about it so much. Like for, for example, uh, tomorrow or any days that I don't do the live stream, um, I don't really have, um, actually I do have an idea for another painting series that I want to start, or at least a painting video that I want to do. Um, and I could start that, but I, I do have like a, a landscape kind of going right now. And I can just jump into that tomorrow for my, for my daily art time. And it takes nothing. I mean, I open up a file and I pick up my uh, stylus and I'm, I'm going, I'm at it, I'm done, you know? So it's just so accessible. And if I'm on the go somewhere, 
haven't traveled in forever because I'm still, um, I don't fly now because I'm still afraid of getting COVID. I, uh, you know, because of my kidney transplant, I am very, um, immunocompromised. So I still don't travel. And whenever, whenever I do that, I'll probably bring my iPad along with a sketchbook just in case. I have an old iPad with an old Apple pencil. Works just great. Just dive right in instantly. So I, I love that aspect of it. And from what we've, what I've learned from doing um, this live stream of a painting, you know, this is the first time I've worked up a painting this far digitally before actually painting it traditionally. And I remember so much from the, the digital painting of what we did there and things that we tried out, things that worked, things that did not work. And it's informed this painting uh, a, a ton. And I have another, you know, I have another piece, a digital piece that I could, you know, I could sell prints of. Maybe an NFT, I've never done that before and I'm not sure if that's even still viable now, but probably not. I don't even, I, it just seems kind of weird to me. I, I'm not sure if I want to do NFTs, but anyway, getting off topic. So yeah, I'm going to try and keep it uh, very much a part of my painting repertoire. I will say repertoire, not process, because if you say this is your process, Well, I guess I can say that and still not be tied to it too much. Meaning that um, I can change it. I can say, okay, for this one, I really don't need to work it up digitally. Let's just go straight to painting. Or the other route would be for this one, it's just going to be digital and I'm not going to bring it into a traditional painting, you know, something like that. So giving myself a room to make a change if I wanted to. which I think can happen with anything. I mean, you just say, yeah, I'll do it this way because I think it this, this would work better for it. Yeah. So that's, that would be the caveat there is yes. And, and I like that there's kind of a fuzz of some foliage back here that breaks into this tree. That's a bit lighter. very unfocused really breaks up the edge of that tree The one thing that I'm thinking about right now is you know, questions I've seen on the internet, questions I have right now. Hey Vox, welcome to the stream. I think that's how you pronounce it, Vox, Vox Pox. The one thing I'm thinking about, and I think other artists that are digital in nature, because it's, it's so accessible that many artists start out digitally, especially on like something like procreate with an iPad, and get really good at it. And the question is, you know, should I try traditional painting? And really, I don't know. I think it, it kind of, 
sound similar to um if I said okay I'm I'm an I paint in oils and then someone would say well you really need to try watercolor if you're an oil painter you have to go into watercolor because it will just um expand your knowledge of oil paint in some way and I just don't see that <laughs> I think if if I suggested to others to, I mean, and this is on a stream that is called traditional and digital. And it's mostly about the idea that there's a lot of artists out there that um, refuse to get into anything digital. because it goes against like this whole kind of old master traditional kind of idea. I'm trying to show people how, how beneficial digital is and how much it can help you tr as a traditional artist. So that conversion I think is really important. You know, adding digital to your traditional, um, you know, daily painting or, or whatever you do, it helps out tremendously, can help out tremendously. But the other way around, I'm not sure. I am honestly not sure. How can a medium like oil painting help you become a better digital artist? And that's really the question that you, I think people want to um, ask there. How, how could oil painting help me become a better digital artist? I haven't heard of an AI that can do traditional oil painting yet, right? Yeah. <laughs> Robotics need to catch up. Yeah, you know, months ago, I got into generating a lot of AI with Midjourney. And, you know, when you're looking at it daily, you don't see the progression. And you're like, yeah, this is pretty cool, you know, waiting for it to get good at this and to get good at that. And it's great for idea generation because it'll do things that you would never think of. It will also do a bunch of things that you should never think of. Right. Um, but being out of it for a while and, and then looking at some of the images that have been generated recently, it's like, uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't know how digital artists can survive in some industries. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, AI art is nowhere near as good as the best artists on uh, ArtStation. You go on ArtStation and look at some of the top artists on there and, you know, AI doesn't hold a candle to what they come up with. But the rub on this, the issue, is all of the other artists on there? that are like me, you know, I'm not the best digital artist. Um, AI is, you know, head and shoulders above, you know, what we can do when we're just starting out. So really uh, the, the scary thing about it is, is um, artists new at digital that want to make a career um, at digital painting has another thing to compete against and you look at um, you know there's a lot of digital artists that make some really good digital works like on uh, Shutterstock and um, I bought a bunch of digital art for a website that I created uh, years ago uh, from Shutterstock, f Shutterstock from an artist and I'm like this guy's amazing he's awesome and now you go on Shutterstock and they have a place where you can digitally generate 
from AI. Images and print them out. Get them sent to you. Um, and I know that that person, you know, that got some of my money is probably, you know, has a shelf life for that revenue stream. I think that that revenue stream is not going to be something that they can rely upon in the future. So there's, there's certain industries that, that will be made obsolete. Or, you know, maybe not obsolete, but they'll be kind of um, a niche thing that isn't so prevalent. Kind of like photography in, in the um, early to, well, in the 1800s, so 19th century photography. Before then, you know, portraits was a career that uh, many artists could rely upon. And then when, you know, there people would pay, you know, top dollar for to sit in front of the best artist or even not the best artist to get a portrait of them because they wanted to send an image of them to someone else or, you know, uh, to capture a moment in, in their family's life or something like that. And there was no photos at that time. But then photos came out and then everybody's like, oh, I can just go to this place, get my photo taken for a fraction of the price from John Singer Sargent painting my portrait or whoever. And, uh, you know, it takes, you know, one hundredth of the time. Yeah, things change. I mean, I'm pretty sure that many uh, artists saw a, a huge decrease in their revenue because of the photograph. And, and I think this is, you know, this is what's going to happen with some digital industries. So this is kind of leading me to, if there is anything that could probably help out digital artists, or, or is there, if there's any way that traditional art can help out digital artists is in that modality. But honestly, if, I mean, if, if your dream is to go into the gaming industry, movie industries, um, they're all digital now for concepting, for design. It's, it's all digital because, um, it saves time and money. And if they can cut costs on production, production costs, if they could cut costs by, you know, not hiring, um, a set of artists and then, um, use AI to generate a lot of concepts. It's going to happen. I mean, you best believe that they would do that. It's unfortunate, but it's, I think it's going to be kind of a future thing that we'll have to deal with. I have no idea. I think, uh, you know, it's kind of like speculating on the future, which everybody does. Um, the worst that will happen, in my opinion, is exactly with a the photograph. There's still a ton of, of portrait painters out there that make a great living from doing portrait painting. Uh, they're really good portrait painters and that's what makes them sought after, you know? So the photograph hasn't completely destroyed that industry. It's just, um, it's made it better in some ways, maybe easier. You have to be really good to be a portrait painting painter that's sought after. And that can make that, uh, do, you know, make enough money from it to live from it. These are all opinions, by the way, obviously. I think it's obvious, hopefully. And what I'm doing here is I'm actually going back through what, you know, I put down a bunch of darker color here. 
and I'm still constantly looking back and forth from the, and it's so dark for you guys. Uh, and that's, it, that's really good to, to see. Um, but I, I'm trying to, I'm building in some, some lighter colors in here to get some accurate variation of these trees and things that I've added in. Uh, so it's not just kind of a blank slate. Keeping it really fuzzy, really unfocused. Uh, that may basically means, you know, uh, very soft edges everywhere on this because I don't want any hard edges back here at the moment. The, the reason why I do that is because you can always easily get harder edges with extra layer of paint with new brush strokes. But trying to turn a dry brush stroke from a, a hard edge to a soft edge is very difficult. It's just, you know, paint over it, basically. Uh, so starting out soft and then working your way to harder edges is always a bit safer. But back to what I'm seeing on the live stream, because I got my phone here and I'm actually looking at the little tiny image of the live stream. And it's, it looks like I'm just working in blacks uh, on, down there at the bottom for you guys. It's really interesting. It's not that dark here. And I think it could be because my ISO is pretty low. I could make an adjustment. Oh, it's set to 400. Let's see, let's go up to five. Let's see, if I get too, too much ISO on there, you'll get a bunch of glare. But maybe you can see some of the, uh, the colors that I've been adding, or the values I've been adding over here. And just like we did with Digital Thinker, if you remember, is... Um, I had in the background just, you know, similar hues of green that went from dark to light. And then on a subsequent layer digitally, I went through and added in all kinds of more interesting colors. I think we'll do the same here with the, with the glazing layers that I'll be adding in probably Monday or Tuesday. Well, I need to get those palm fronds figured out again redo them again I say again because I remember redoing them several times on the on the digital painting yeah that's a good reminder all of the the problems that I figured out with those darn palm fronds within the digital painting you know I don't have to do that with this painting there's so much that uh, got better just by having the iterations digitally. Yes, the new ISO setting makes it easier to see. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm adding some variation in these other green areas. Oh, it's so sticky. I do not like the stickiness. You know, the only other way that I know of to follow fat over lean and to not use an alkyd medium but an oil like um and and like if i wanted to use a different medium to to block in a bunch of color uh would be to use like a refined linseed oil or one of the the uh, fluid mediums, and I think the fluid mediums get a bit sticky as well. 
the, the non-solvent fluid medium. Uh, that's the only other thing that I can think of to do. But if I used the refined linseed oil, I would need to let that dry, that layer dry completely. Now when I say completely, uh, and when you paint thin, that would take maybe three to four days max for it to dry completely. And uh, there's something about, and I don't know the exact science behind this. If there's a certain point where if you let the, the oil paint dry longer than this point, you have to let it continually dry for six months before you put anything over it. Um, don't quote me on that. I'm not certain of why that is or if that's very true. I just remember hearing it. But what I've done for years on a lot of these paintings is the subsequent layers, if they have oil in them, I'll let them dry for three to four days. They're not tacky. I could put my hand, my finger over them and not pull off any paint. And they're thin. I paint really thin and uh, dry to the touch three to four days. And I, and I go over them with uh, glazing layers. And I've done that for years and years. And I have not seen any cracking, any problems, nothing with any of my work doing that. And I may continue with that way of doing it if I need um, kind of an underlayer with some medium in it. Because the purpose of fat over lean is to make sure that the underlayers dry faster than the ones on top. That's the purpose of it. So if you just give the underlayers time to dry before adding any glazes on top, it's fine. You're doing the same thing. There is there, and I think where that uh, time frame is coming from, the extra time frame where I was talking about, where you have to let them dry for uh, an extra amount of time just in case, is there there is going to be some off gassing of the paint. I, I know that sounds like really bad, like uh, maybe toxic or whatever, but um, it will continue to dry for you know six months or whatever. The the layers underneath. and the subsequent layers. So if you continue to add more oil, even um, on the subsequent layers, after you've let the ones underneath dry, uh, you will be fine because those subsequent layers have more oil. Yeah. And I, I keep kind of talking about that. I'm just gonna kind of let it go. Maybe the when someone asked me about fat over lean again, because I still get the question, like all the time. How can you do fat over lean without solvents? It's, it's not an either or, it's on a spectrum. And now that there's alkyds, it's another choice. Um, I think maybe the question that I'll ask people is like, well, I mean, are you just starting out? Is this your first time oil painting? Or do you have, um, do you have a need to save your paintings for decades and decades? Or are you just struggling to make a good painting? Focus on making good paintings first, whatever that is to you. Good is a subjective term. Maybe you're doing abstract beautiful abstract paintings and you started doing beautiful abstract paintings from the beginning and people love them and people want to buy them heck yeah worry over fat worry about fat, fat over lean definitely but if you're in high school like I was and you don't even know how to draw a figure yet 
accurately with great proportions and you want to make figure paintings, I, I don't even worry about oil painting. <laughs> Do about uh, 5,000 figure drawings. Yeah, I'm not kidding about that number. Yeah, if you think I am kidding about that number, uh, look at my website, chrisbevan.com. If you know my name, you know my website, Chris Bevan. It's linked in the description as well. Uh, I have logged every single day for the past 10 years uh, on my blog and my website of art. And you can flip through, what is today? 3,696 days in a row. Uh, in a row, but mind you. 3,690 something days in a row, you will see thousands of figure drawings, gestures, drawings, lots and lots of bad figure drawings. <laughs> and I do that intentionally. I show every stupid little thing that I do. <laughs> lots of uh, drawing from still life and landscape and some of them in classes, some of them in uh, life drawing, uh, some digital charcoal, uh, acrylic gouache. Um, I don't think I have any watercolor on there. And, you know, the answer to getting good, you know, lots of time and effort, you know, and whatever good means to you, right? Time and effort. And probably the most thing, most important thing is fun. You know, you're not going to do this for that much, that much time if you're not having fun doing it. So enjoying what you do. So if you don't enjoy it, see how you can change it up and still learn, but enjoy what you're doing. And that's another reason, reason thinker. I want to get back to kind of like some portrait paintings. Um, because they're small and they're part of the figure. You know, I want to get into figurative work again. I love figure painting. Um, I've been on this tiger for a long time. And um, I think that's what I'll try and focus on more than anything. But I'm not tired of this tiger. I think it's, it's, Every single day, it's getting better and better. We worked hard digitally to get this, uh, to get it prepared for a traditional painting. All right, I'm gonna step back and look at what we got. Yeah, because we're right at six o'clock. Yeah, that looks much better. Uh, when I stood back before, you know, the background that I put in was just kind of this these blocks of big green color and now that there's some variation that is describing form that it's it's trying to what would i say before it's not brush strokes it's an object and there's a difference you know um Everything's made up of brush strokes, but you see the object first rather than brush strokes. And I'm starting to see the object first rather than the brush stroke. So the background's looking really good uh, for this first pass on it. And 
the next stream, which will be on Monday, we're going to uh, move back up to close to the top with the palm fronds. And I'm going to be focusing on uh, getting the palm fronds laid in. Hopefully the alkyd mediums are dry. Uh, and I probably won't use any more alkyd, honestly. Not sure if I like it too much. Just because of the stickiness after it starts to dry. So before I shut down, I'm going to go ahead and set up for Monday. I have a very inexpensive easel. So it doesn't go up and down very easily sometimes. Okay, so the painting's in a good spot. My palette's in a good spot. And the last thing I do after every painting session is I clean my palette. And I mixed up a big area of dark color. And that's just going to have to go in the garbage because it will be dry uh, well before Monday. It'll be dry um, probably by the end of the day tomorrow or before then. Maybe tonight it will be dry. I'm going to go ahead and pull all of that red off because I have too much color mixed into it already. Like one of the worst things you can do, well, not that's not the worst thing, but here's a good way to kill your motivation to get started painting is to not clean your palette after your, your last painting session uh, so that when you want to start painting, you look at your palette, you look at all your materials and you say, oh man, I have to clean up all that stuff before I can even get started painting. No, it's okay. I won't do that today. You know, that's <laughs> that will definitely kill your motivation. Wait, I have to clean up before I can even get started. Best to do it uh, at the end of every session. And it doesn't, I mean, if you set up things where it doesn't take long, like, you know, my palette is pretty much done. All I'd have to do the next session is just put out some more paint from tubes. Uh, I'm going to, I, you know, I check out my non-toxic oil painting video for uh, how to clean your brushes so that you will not really clean your brushes but get most of the paint out of them so that they can go into the uh, the soaking bucket that I have that way you can not you don't have to worry about cleaning your brushes every single time oh that's kind of funny you can see the background behind my my canvas here okay so thanks for joining the stream if you're interested in downloading any of the reference material from this traditional to digital or traditional and digital live stream uh, check out the link in the description for my gumroad there's about 53 days of digital downloads there for one freaking dollar it's ridiculous value for a dollar um you get every single day of me working up this tiger painting digitally. Also, uh, a whole composition course that I did, plus the design process download that led us to this composition for the tiger. Ridiculous amount of value. And if you know any other artists that can benefit from what I'm doing here, please, 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 I'm always looking to help other individuals, uh, other artists become better versions of themselves. So let them know. Have them tune in, have them watch the live stream, or check out the downloads. That's all for me, guys. Thank you so much for joining, and uh, have a wonderful weekend. I will see you Monday.